So an hour is quite relevant in sepsis for a lot of reasons, as you will know, and it seemed to be a relevant title um, as a result. We, I thought a bit of context around what we face in acute community care was important. We, we have a rising comorbid population, um, exponentially rising, to the point where we've now had to invent a whole new categorization of comorbidity that involves 50 or more comorbidities. So 20 years ago, we didn't have that problem. Five was a lot, and you were lucky to survive with 10. Now we have 20 to 50, of which there were 83,000 infective admissions last year, um, and we're now up to 50 plus, of which there are smaller numbers, thankfully, but who have a considerably higher mortality rate. It's eminently predictable who's going to die and who's going to survive when they come into hospital with an infection. It's all related to age, comorbidity, pre-existing diseases, frailty, vulnerability. It's a marker of our population. Um, and over the same time period, we know that people have got sicker. So when you look at seven or eight years' worth of admission news data, so this is, these, this is from Portsmouth Hospital, around 36,000 ED attendances, and the news calculated at each juncture um, and then looked at from the Emergency Admission Department's admissions news. And what you find is that we started at around 1.4 of the news um, six or seven years ago. We're now pushing 1.7. Um, so everything we feel in the emergency department, in our wards, in our GP surgeries, in ambulance services is real. You know, these are getting sicker. Patients are sicker, they're older, they're more comorbid. This is why the NHS is under pressure and strain. And um, we have to be very mindful about what we're asking of our, our services as a result in view of this extra pressure, this extra work. And, and, and you know, I compare my life 20 years ago as a junior doctor, it was a lot simpler there weren't so many drugs, there weren't so many tests, there weren't so many treatments. I could handle a three-day weekend, just about. Nowadays, you know, that is not an option. The amount we can do and the amount of deterioration, our wards are like intensive care units used to be 10 years ago and are manned with a nursing ratio of eight to nine patients per, um, per nurse, or HCA if you're lucky, and, uh, you know, one junior doctor at night looking after 200, 300 patients. So it, it is... It is a case of resource demand and, and what is possible rather than um, what is perfect at this point. Um, infection is a big part of everything we do in, in healthcare. The reason being, when you actually look at the bed occupancy and you look at the diagnoses that are keeping people in hospital, it soon becomes apparent that nearly three quarters of NHS beds are occupied by people with an infection. And at any one point in time, a third of the inpatient NHS population is on antibiotics. Big numbers. Um, infections themselves cause 41% of hospital mortality. It was responsible for 35% of all emergency admissions. But the occupancy of 75% tells you it's a sicker group that, l that stays in hospital for longer. So however we badge this, infection, sepsis, whatever, um, it is a big drain on resources and probably the biggest cause of NHS expenditure in inpatient settings. Um, and we have a sequin that says, you know, if you do things right, we'll give you X amount of money, and it works out at huge amounts of money, you know, one million pounds at certain big organisations. But when you factor in the actual impact of infection in terms of bed days, length of stay, death, ICU, drug budget, staffing costs, you soon get to a figure of near enough 23, 30 million pounds per trust just in bed days alone. Um, when you factor in ICU um, and litigation and all sorts of other things, the cost just ramps up and up and up. And what we've perhaps got to be better at doing is articulating the argument for improving infection care, um, both in terms of AMR, stewardship, but also the management of the most sick, those with potentially sepsis. Even a small deflection, a small reduction in length of stay within this group leads to dramatic cost savings potentially, both within the normal bed stock which is critical at this time, um, and also potentially the HDU and ICU bed stock. If you can reduce the acuity by getting to it early enough with antibiotics or the right in treatments, and not so many patients will end up requiring intubation, ventilation. And this is, you know, another goal. Can we prevent rather than can we cure? Because curing is much harder. So the question to a lot of boards is around, you know, how seriously they're going to take this on. Can we facilitate um, reliable... Uh, process interventions with patients with bad infection um, and who's actually going to deliver on it you know who's actually got it in their job plan to actually take this on 
So I, I say this as a beleaguered sepsis lead without any additional time to do this. So you do it in addition to your day job, all that data capture, all that sequence stuff, all of the quality improvement, all of the teaching, the training, you know, where is, there's no time to actually do it. There's no resource to do it, is there? You fit it into your spare time. It's a tough ask, isn't it? So the question is how you share that across an organization, how you, how you make leadership aware that this is a problem and that leadership should support this to happen and perhaps not use the same people all the time, all the time for the same projects. You know, there are, there's, there's places we can dip into and the burden shared by many would always, would always be something that's more achievable. We, we have the, 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 the prospect of thinking about the equipoise. Um, Celia Ringham Clark was talking about uh, sides of the same coin, and she's absolutely right. You know, we can't go giving antibiotics to anything and everything that comes in. We are on borrowed time with our antibiotic management. And you, we have to think very carefully about where we put that red line. You know, having come from a situation years ago where we only ever treated if we were absolutely certain, to moving more towards when it's possible, we've got to be a bit more clever about things. We've got to think about the influence of what clinical judgment adds to our armory and give our clinicians permission and our systems permission to sit on the ball sometimes and say, it might be, it might not be. Because the evidence is not that strong still about the value of giving everyone antibiotics who's physiologically unwell. And you know we have to understand that there is ongoing study and research in this field. More of which later. So that slide hasn't worked. It's been a very interesting article that's just come out from um, America, actually, um, looking at this inception of what they call SEP1, which is an entire bundled approach to, um, to sepsis care. And uh, they, they're trying to mandate this across the whole of the US. And that involves things that are akin to our sepsis 6 plus. So that also includes central line, a few of the elements of the surviving sepsis campaign, blood lactate, a kind of playback approach, but you need at least six or seven components to fulfill the criteria and get the remuneration or to be indeed to be doing things the right way. It was all very well meant. You know, they've got very strong charities like we do in this country, Rory's Fund, etc., that have really been pushing the US as a whole to really take this on. But you can't just release this without some nod towards judgment, the experience of clinicians, and, and an understanding of how complex conditions like infection and sepsis are. You, you know, it can never be as simple as one sheet of A4 as to what, what, how people present and how you define it. It is complicated stuff. It, and, it, and it's the nuances of that clinical experience and what we teach people in different environments who are learning and aspiring to be clinicians in the future about the real red flags associated with this condition um, that, that is gonna be the key to the NHS. It, what's what sets us apart as being a good country of clinicians who, who use their clinical skills well on the whole. Um, and you know, they use words like lobotomy and guidance and process in the article to great effect, but it's an entertaining read if you, if you do get a chance. There's, there's a great deal of harm we get from separating conditions that are generalized and generalizable, like deterioration and sepsis. And sepsis is only a very, very small component of what general deterioration is. The bigger component is infection, and then a degree of badness happens if the infection that defines a patient as being septic, for want of a better expression. But everything else falls around it. So you have trauma, you have frailty, um, you have COPD, you have breathing disorders, endocrine disorders. They're all part of the same family. And uh, the problem with an isolationist blinkered approach to this is we will, we will lose people along the way. When you, when you go in and think about what is done for sepsis, at the moment, it, it can be a bit scary. When you do the national survey and see that out of the 127 respondents, 25% was doing one of four different screening tools, you could understand why we're in the mess we're in. Um, so this really built the, the push towards news and uh, a single definition and a single language for deterioration because our, our clinicians were a bit confused. You know, what, do, what, what, what should I actually be following? Um, and the NCPOD report really built the way for this. There've been a lot of tensions within the sepsis world or infection world, you know, how do we define it? Should it be an ivory tower type definition? Um, a life threatening dysfunction of organs caused by dysregulated host response to that infection. You know, how many times have you actually seen that? Um, I've seen someone who looks really sick, who's got an infection 
and he doesn't appear to be responding to the treatment. Uh, you know, this, this concept of infection with badness probably sits better. Mervyn Singer coined both of these definitions. I think the left-hand one's more of the unofficial one that he actually uses day-to-day -day when he sees patients. The right-hand one is a bit of a mouthful if you're in the middle of a busy ward round. And, 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 you know, this is where, you know, the conflict. Is it really 7.6% for every hour you deal antibiotics and septic shock? Really? You know, it's a really flawed study. Um, and, you know, we've based a lot of our goodwill behind our sepsis campaigns on that information. The general public has taken this on and said, you know, this is, this is the truth. This is the way it is. But the more you analyse the paper, the more you realise how flawed that data is. Um, maybe it's much less. And, you know, the, the smart money is probably on a 2 to 4% improvement per hour. Now, no one's going to say it's a, the wrong thing to do. You know, giving antibiotics is absolutely the right thing to do if you think someone is rip roaring septic. And early, the sooner the better. But it's not just about the antibiotics. It's about the fluids, the senior review, the escalation. You know, it's getting experienced pairs of hands on this case to actually see whether escalation to ICU is the right thing or calling it at base and, uh, you know, this is actually the limit of how far we're going. The numbers themselves are controversial. So you have some places where they think 250,000 cases occur per year. And you have others where it's the number might be lower, around 36,000. Um, one could argue the ICNOC data is a lot, is pretty accurate based on evidence um, as opposed to an estimate. So, and it probably represents the savable, salvageable population who come into hospital with real badness or real infection. That's where I send all my patients with sepsis if they're for appropriate escalation and for resuscitation and for inotropes. Um, and, you know, that tension of what is the real number is really central to all of our issues with not just naming sepsis for what it is, but trying to define how big the problem is. Um, you know, from day to day, I, people say to me, oh, let's do a sepsis screen. And I think, what do you mean by a sepsis screen? And then they'll say, I want to do a septic screen. And I'm thinking, what does that mean in relation to a sepsis screen? And it gets really confusing. Language is really important in this. So we, we have to kind of agree, what do we mean by screening? What do we need by testing an infection and how seriously are we going to take the results? Um, we have huge high profile cases, which I'm not going to talk about today, but we all know who the GMC recently were involved with, against this, you know, this tsunami of antibiotic resistance. So we don't want an NHS where anyone and everything coming in with a sniffle and a bit of a fever gets antibiotics. We've got to be sensible. And, and whatever guidance we follow has to be properly impactful. You can't have 70% of the medical take being classified as being septic and given antibiotics, or 70% of kids arriving in an emergency department with a fever being, you know, lumber punctured and given antibiotics. We need impact measurement here, both in terms of the emergency take, but also on what people come into hospital with, potentially, or call up for that urgent GP appointment. Um, it has to be nuanced and it has to be measured for impact in everything we do, the literature, the advertising, the safety netting, public-facing campaigns. It almost worked. Um, so in terms of definitions, uh, so I presented this slide to Mervyn, actually, uh, and he agreed with it, which I thought was really impressive. Um, and, and the question, I suppose, from, from my non-intensive care background perspective was whether we could simplify things down and go with this because sepsis really does fit into this concept of a wicked problem there is no obvious solution to it it's so dynamic and changing and there are so many challenges towards trying to sort out the simplicity we 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 went down this line of having read observations as being our initial thought as to how we should manage sepsis and they're they're not bad but unfortunately not very accurate and um not very specific so what you find when you go down a red root of observation, so that's extreme observation parameters, pulse more than 131, blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury, hypoxia. You find that there is a 40% increase in calls um, or, or definitions of sepsis, for instance, with only a minimal increase in the detection rate of patients that are at risk of dying. And, you know, this is really important because we're at stretched, we're stretched to breaking point across the NHS and our impact point has to be evidential. And, and when, you, when you try and put that into a unit, so you, you try and put a red flag kind of approach or, or um, uh, a nice high-risk criteria approach into, into a, a working environment, an acute sector environment, you find that you get a lot of the medical take that get defined as you know, needing that urgent senior review and potentially having sepsis. So 
this is what I mean by impact. It has to be tested. It has to be properly assessed for, for impact. And we have to be very mindful of what we're, we're, we're telling people as a result. Um, we had the third international consensus definitions. And um, interestingly, UCLH, where obviously the lead author was, uh, have used news because essentially it outperforms QuickSofa. Um, it's made up of many more parameters, as you know, seven parameters versus QuickSofa's three. Um, and, you know, appears to do a better job at being more sensitive and specific for, you know, what we're after really, which is infection with badness, mortality. Um, and our question then is, if news outperforms QuickSofa and other use in predicting outcomes, can we prove it? Um, Chirpec did this for us quite nicely last year um, when he compared news, news, QuickSofa and SIRS in the hospital environments and found that the area under the receiver operating curve, which is kind of the prediction of sensitivity and specificity of using a particular scoring scale, showed that news pretty much outperformed everything else. And we have a paper in pre-pub that is looking at the same sort of question within patients with infection. And what it's showing is that if you've got an infection, news is the best scoring system. Um, the area under the receiver operating curve, that is, is, is way off the scale. It's, it's impressive stuff. And, you know, I guess it's sensible and logical because if you think about where news came from, it came from real patients who were in hospital beds in England with emergency problems. So it was always going to pick up infection because of how common it is um, as a reason for admission. In A&E, it's good. In the ambulance, it's good. So the, the next question on our lips is really what about the community? And this is where we're at now. It's, you know, it's not validating the community settings, but it needs to be. You know, we need, we need to look at the evidence of whether it works in community settings, whether it can improve the communication, improve the safety, the urgency where patients are with proper sickness are assessed, and, and, and it needs to be tested for impact as well. So we've been after this concept of a national screening tool, and um, the survey that I alluded to earlier showed that there was a 25-25-25 split between the three main protagonists, and then 25% who were doing something completely different. So, you know, it's unsurprising we had a great deal of fluctuation and variance in sequin reported numbers because everyone was doing it in a different way. And one of the, you know, one of the interesting part was the free text. So what we found from the organizations that responded, so there were 127 responses in terms of organizations. Um, the common thing that everyone was doing was they were all using an early warning system and the majority of the trusts were using news. So the question to us at the end of this report was, you know, if news appears to show the best signal towards identifying patients at risk of death from having infection. And, you know, 65 to 75% of the country is doing it already. Why don't we just go for that? And it was, it was an interesting conversation that just carried on and on and on as a result. And it became pushing against an open door because I think people started waking up to the variation that does exist and the chaos that that can produce. We have to be a bit honest about what sepsis is as a, as a condition itself. Um, and I've spent a lifetime trying to figure out what it is because I, I still don't absolutely know for certain. It doesn't have a test result that tells you um, this is sepsis. Um, wh when you're sick, you come in with opacity because no one's really sure what's wrong with you. You have a clue, you have a differential diagnosis, a batting order of what you suspect. And this is why the terminology, why it was really important terminology changed from being sepsis to suspected sepsis because that's what we see clinically. We have a sniff that it might be there. We're not sure. We have a suspicion. Um, and it's only really towards the end of the admission that you really get to the truth of why it is someone came in, whether it was even likely in the first place, by a combination of the test results, what clinicians wrote in the notes, what they treated the patient with. And this is where we need to be heading with our coding to interpret the measurement of how big a problem this is. So... The badness is really defined by where patients are admitted. And um, as a result of that, and our knowledge that there is no gold standard test for sepsis, so you, you kind of think with all your other conditions, and I jealously look at stroke, heart attack, and trauma and think, well, there's a, I can see a break on the film, and even me as a non-traumatologist, I can see a fracture. I can see ST elevation on an ECG. I can, I can see a hemiparesis, but good luck on sepsis, eh? You know, a myriad of presentations, never two patients the same. And, um, you know, this is, this is where we're flailing at the moment. So we don't have a diagnostic test. And although our clinical gold standard is going to be the judgment of healthcare professionals, because at the end of the day, it's the best we can do because of how complicated this is, 
you know, we are searching for that diagnostic test. Because if you ask a bunch of intensive care specialists who thought they understood the consensus guidance perfectly, the sepsis three, and then gave them four um, made up case vignettes and said, how many of those four have sepsis? You get a massive split in the numbers. So even in intensive care, where you'd hope they'd have expertise in sepsis, they don't always agree which makes it even harder for people that aren't in, well, maybe easier for people who are out in intensive care to, to come up with their own assumptions. So we have this, this roadmap for identifying patients who are severely ill, using clinical judgment, and trying to create something that's more realistic and pragmatic in, in terms of how we actually operate as clinicians in the shop floor, in the environments where patients like this are detected. Um, news two, and the changes they're in. Um, so it was really good. We've got a chronic hypoxia subchart now. We've got new confusion added to AVPU, so we're picking up delirium, which is fantastic. We have an ABCD approach, so it follows the resus kind of guidance. We've de-escalated the value of single parameter threes because they're not as good as aggregate scores. Um, and we have a good sepsis chapter to try and define the place of news in infection and sepsis. Um, as we heard this morning from Celia Ringham Clark, the future sequence is going to be based around News 2, which means that as an acute trust, you will not be getting your money unless you use News 2. So the mandate is there, um, and maybe the springboard for all of this. I suspect similar mandate will be coming into ambulance services very soon. I think it won't necessarily come in immediately to general practice for obvious reasons, but it will be a domino effect. So this is a sample from the News 2 chart and the two oxygen scales, and you can see that if you've got normal, that's the top part of the AB, and then if you've, if you've got your chronic hypoxic state, you actually score if you get put on oxygen and your SATs are above 97%. So hopefully, the plan is that it will reduce over-triggers of an over-calling patients with COPD on respiratory wards who you know, trigger all the time, um, despite being stable. Um, and, uh, but, but we'll guard against the, the obvious poisoning with oxygen that leads to narcosis. Um, it, you know, it, it is an attempt to try and set the parameters correct. And the, the D part, the, the new confusion, sits with the rest of the, the VPU, so it scores as highly another three points. So it, this is about trying to ascertain who's newly confused. And it was based on the squid, so the single question in delirium kind of questionnaire. So this was around, you know, because you could have a 30-point questionnaire to see if someone has delirium or not, which is not going to work on a ward, busy ward. Um, you know, the, the best question, that certainly I've always found over the years, is ask a relative whether the patient's more confused than normal, or, or make an assumption, do I think this patient's more confused than normal? Because um, pragmatically, it was the only way it was going to kind of work. So um, this is an interpretation of what the, I think the Royal College of Physicians has now produced a chart similar, but the, I the idea is, can we turn this into a poster? Um, because uh, can we turn it to an app? Can we turn it into something that can be used from hospital wards and environments? Um, the uh, South Central Ambulance Line's there because we've sent this out to all our GP surgeries um, to try and get them to take it on. And um, to try and reinforce the fact they have a hotline number because, you know, you don't want your GP and is in a busy surgery having to phone 999 and tell the operator, yeah, the patient's breathing. Um, you know, what you want them to do is to talk to a professional and say, I'm worried about the patient. This is their news. They're sitting in the surgery now with a pneumonia. I'm really worried about sepsis. Um, and then uses eight, can you send an ambulance? And that ambulance person knowing what to do, pushing the buttons to get that blue light over there. Or not, depending on the physiology and you know, what, what, what the protocol says. So in terms of combining deterioration and sepsis as a pathway, because this is our real opportunity, um, we have this common pathway, we have this opportunity to bring in news to in that environment, to try and embed it, because we, we know that when these OBS get done when there's worry, we do the physiological sets of observations and we, we, we define the acute episode baseline. And then it's the progression through the pathway that tells us what ends up happening with the patient. The frequency of observations is listed by the, by the degree of instability right at the beginning, so the news at the beginning. And then if you're in the mild, more green pathway, and this is where, this is a kind of combined interpretation of deterioration and sepsis. So the idea is get rid of the sepsis pathway, get rid of a deterioration pathway, just have one sick person pathway. And this is what we're trialing in Wessex, so it's kind of a bit hot off the press. But the idea is that I've tried to put in the concerning clinical features from the NHS England um, sepsis implementation guidance and a bit of nice stuff as well, so some of the high-risk criteria and the UK Sepsis Trust high-risk criteria. 
whilst also keeping it honest with the News 5 stuff. So the idea is you have, you have your three main buckets. If your news is five or more, your three to four is your intermediate, and if your news is zero to two, you're in the green. But you know this is where it's really important. Judgment trumps all of this, because this is only physiology, and it's not a clinician seeing a patient and being worried or reassured about that patient's clinical state. And then you follow the protocol as per, and you know the urgency of that clinical review can be pushed forward by the fact that you know one of these red signs, these warning signs is present, because then you need the clinician to actually say, is this patient really sick, or can I sit on this? Um, and then when you get on the more urgent pathway, the idea is obviously an urgent clinical assessment, that question of is sepsis suspected, use your clinical judgment, yes or no, and then just follow the treatment, it's appropriate, which may or may not be antibiotics, based on that interpretation um, and put together we what, was we were trying to think about how do we create something that is going to work for sick patients whatever the diagnosis is and and obviously there are going to be conditions like heart attack or stroke which will not give that much physiological instability so we you follow your condition specific protocol as well but the more aligned we can be the less times we're going to drop the ball on patients that have real physiological instability which is unfortunately currently where we're sitting so, in terms of this concept of soft science, co, uh, you know, I think people in care homes, nursing homes, do an amazing job, community nursing, carers, you know, with a, who develop this raft of nursing and medical skills just from looking after chronically ill patients. Um, and the question is, can we arm them with something validated to tell them when they should be calling for help? So, this is the concept of soft signs, because they're not really hard medical signs, they're kind of soft signs that someone who's relatively untrained might pick up as being um, something they're worried about. So what is the language of, of normal people when they're worried about a patient? Um, what, is, what is the language they might use on the phone um, to a receptionist who's, again, relatively untrained in a GP surgery who needs you know, a call for help? Um, and so this study was kind of done to look at those particularly frail patients who had either carers involved or... Um, you know, what was the language they used themselves? Um, and, and when should we push the button to get that urgent clinical review as a result? So if we think about infection thought principles of, you know, very aligned to nice, a risk, symptom, severity, we start thinking about, were there any symptoms in the symptoms section that are actually soft sign type symptoms? They're not the questions we generally ask as doctors, certainly. We're terrible. We, we have a list of cough, breathlessness, pleurisy, shortness of breath, and a bit of phlegm being our four or five main respiratory questions. That's it, you know, and, you know, how often do we actually ask them about their transfers or their mobility, their safety walking? Um, how much do we, do we actually ask about their appetite, uh, you know, whether they're off their food or whether they're drinking and eating okay, whether they're a little bit more confused or the memory's not quite what it used to be. Um, but the things that someone who loves that patient or knows that patient well will, will know and quite happily recycle and we get impatient as healthcare professionals we say, no, no, that's not what I'm after. I'm after the medical symptoms that relate to my textbook of what defines someone's pathology, not what's really bothering you as a patient and what's bothering you as a carer and is making you concerned as a loved one. So, you, you know, perhaps, and our hypothesis is that these soft signs happen before these medicalized symptoms develop. So you may get someone who's a bit off their food six days, seven days before the onset of their cough, their breathlessness, their fever. Something was up. And, and you know, carers will tell you this time and time again in emergency situations. I knew something was up, but I just didn't know what. Oh, yeah, but then he fell. And that's when we called the ambulance. So th there is something in this. Um, we haven't identified exactly what those three things are to do with functional behaviour of concern, but that, that's the area we, that's really exciting at the moment, certainly in terms of the pre-deterioration signalling within those sorts of community settings that can predict someone having a bad outcome from infection, for instance, or sepsis, or whatever, um, before we enter the medical kind of nursing assessment process where we ask about specific, very finite symptoms that, that tell us some badness is going on, um, and then do a news eventually and decide whether they should they should come in, but by that time it's too late. You know, the prevention could have come earlier at the soft signs, potentially, if the right <laughs> review had happened. There are red flag signs, so for me, certainly, uh, 
What time are we doing for time? 3.08. I wonder, can we make this a bit interactive? So let's, um, because you've heard me witter on for long enough, could you talk to people next to you about a case of sepsis and then think of a learning point to tell the room? So rather than me tell you what my red flags have been, it'd be really good for you to tell the room yours. And then I'll pick on random people, if that's all right. <laughs> Anyone want to volunteer to share, a, share an anecdote or learning point? Thank you. Can you reach? Hello, this is not the easiest of things to do. Um, I'm lucky to be here. Ten years ago, I went into accident and emergency one night with abdominal pain, being sick. Um, I was trying for another baby. So I assumed I was a woman of a certain age with abdominal pain, so I was stuck on a gynae ward. Um, luckily, my husband has worked in and around the healthcare sector, although he's not um, a clinician. And he knew that something wasn't right. Um, he spoke to the nurses, and he was just waved away as, she's conscious. And then I got to the stage where I wasn't particularly conscious. And, and um, luckily I had PPP. And although I had um, a pre-existing condition, he rang them up and he begged them. And they said, we'll pay for one night. And he literally went and knocked on the door of the private unit and said, please take my wife. And I went in and I was lucky because... Um, then I started getting my observations done. And then I started getting doctors to see me. And I went into theater at six o'clock in the morning, resting as I went through the door of the anesthetic room. Um, I came out with a stoma, um, several operations over three days. Um, there was another lady who was in intensive care at the same time as me. Um, my sepsis was not related to my pre-existing condition, so I went back down to the private unit. She went to the wards, and the nurses were saying as she left the ward, make sure you press your button early because um, uh, you won't get people as quickly coming to you as, um, uh, as they do here in intensive care. And um, it was a horrible, horrible situation. And I think really as a clinician, I'm a nurse, something we learned certainly when I trained was you've got to believe the patient. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't believed and this other lady wasn't believed. Um, and look at your patient, trust your gut instinct, yes. ask questions. I fully agree with that. And also the concern of the, your, your loved one. Yes, you definitely. Know, that's a big factor, isn't it? It's, it's concern and you know, I think people are always concerned about their loved ones, but there is something that's out of proportion sometimes that you think, hmm, actually, this yeah. is more than that. Because, I mean, he, he, my husband was saying, look, she, she had a baby on internet, not if she said she's in pain. Yeah. She's in pain, and off I was sent to the gynae ward, no scans, no x-rays. Thank you, that was really brave. <laughs> um, difficult to follow. <laughs> has, has anyone got any other learning points? Oh, thank you. Hi, I'm um, Anne, I'm a sepsis nurse, and just having to do some case reviews and tracing back when we've missed things or people have died. And um, a lady that we had with neutropenic sepsis, the neutropenia was picked up and she was treated. But when she actually developed septic shock, she, the first thing that was noted going back in the notes was a, lo a loss of mobility. So she went from being independently mobile to yeah. um, <coughs> then needing the help of one um, until like literally over the two days, um, needing the help of two people to get out just to the toilet. So um, like you say, soft signs, but they were picked up by the nurses and escalated. So it's quite a good bit. <laughs> Even in the face of relatively normal physiology sometimes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Her news hadn't gone off yeah. at that point at all. Yeah. 
Oh, hi, my hi. name's Amanda. Um, I work in a mental health trust, and I, I'd be really keen to introduce news too, even though I know it's initially for the acute sector. It's just that we have um, negative experiences when our patients deteriorate on our thought, uh, their news increases, and we think that their suspected sepsis is that the 999 will <coughs> consider that they're still in a hospital bed and we haven't got the facilities to treat patients for suspected sepsis. So no, it, it's just really how we can be supported to introduce news to and you know, care for those patients in the same way as they would if they were in an acute hospital setting. So it's just for consideration, really. No, it's absolutely, and it, it was actually agreed by the Royal College of Psychiatrists as being the scoring scale for all mental health trusts, so it should be coming in. Um, are you, so, sorry to focus on the solution, but um, is, there a, is there a PSC that you're linked with, Patient Safety Collaborative, in your region? Um, no, but we're, we're trying to link in with Aqua in the northwest of England. Yes, good, they're excellent. Um, um, but we're really keen to work with other mental health trusts and if we're going to introduce news into acute settings that I think, as well as consideration for community, you've got to consider the mental health trust because our patients are IV drug yeah. users, they're elderly, they're frail, and you know they they are becoming they're having sepsis and, and dying. Definitely, and uh, you know a big focus of the work stream in the future will be how do we get news in community settings and. and gain the evidence, validation for it, but also um, assistance at implementation. So we've got a meeting on Friday, actually, to look at community, specifically about the implementation of news across all care settings, so. And will that consider mental health settings as well? Yeah, can you email me after, it should be up on the thing. Yeah, and then I'd we'll, love to. Well, I mean, <laughs> anyone can email me, but you know. Great. Um, has anyone got anything else? Or should we carry on? carry on for a bit and then if you get bored we'll do something else <laughs> right so uh, in terms of red flags for me so I was, I've just drawn on these these are cases I've seen over the years so as, as you know group A strep or gas is a terrible terrible condition it leads to lots of amputations losses of limbs lots of films um, and the cases I've seen of which there have been about four or five over the years they've always had DNV firstly which you know we think of as gastroenteritis a viral kind of condition uh, and to my shame, at least on half of the cases, I, I've treated people as gastroenteritis, at least in the early stages of this condition. And it was only really in each case that the pain became out of proportion, particularly in limbs that weren't affected by, the, by, by any cellulitis at the time. And then eventually, petechiae that formed and inflammatory blood tests that really shot up and eventually a news that really kicked off or physiology that became really abnormal. Fast, really fast progression. But um, those were the learning points I took away, really, from the cases I've seen, certainly. And in terms of skin, drawing a line is so important. Um, you know, just as doing a news when you first pick up a deterioration is really important, it is our barometer about whether things are getting worse or better. And in the cases I've seen, there's usually a trauma precipitant. Um, I've seen a good 10 cases over the years, unfortunately. Again, pain out of proportion is a massive component. And then you get this early discoloration of the skin. So instead of day 7, 10, 14 necrosis of skin purpura, which you normally see with severe cellulitis, you'll get it day 1, day 2, within hours of the onset. And that's a real red flag for me. Um, with chests, um, I think Curb 65 is, has got merit. I think it confuses the hell out of our clinicians when they're trying to use other scoring scales to assess people with general deterioration. And as a result, we don't use it. Um, I'm not saying it's terrible, um, it's just if you're waiting for a respiratory rate of 30 to give someone intravenous antibiotics, you've missed the boat. Um, so we, we, we use news. Um, and, and over the years, the people that I've had who've, who've unfortunately passed away have usually come in on antibiotics, so partial treatment in the community setting that always slightly masks their physiology so they don't look as bad on paper as they really are, but that's because they've been on amoxicillin for two weeks already and it hasn't done a lot. Um, the multiple attendances, particularly in the younger population, to out of hour services, recurrent GPs, appointments, phoning a receptionist 20 times because you know, you're, you're dead worried as a parent. You know, these are the real red flags we need to be teaching healthcare professionals. 
about historically. And then this concept of difficulty with your mobility, your standing. That was a blood culture sample from someone who got admitted on the take um, a, few, a few years ago. He, he, it was a full blood count. And I got a really excited call from the haematologist who said, look, this guy is so septic, I'm actually seeing the bugs lysing the cells in front of me. Terrible. Um, he's never seen one of these before. And I, obviously, I, I, I tried to nod sensibly because I'm not a haematologist. I didn't really understand what the blood film was, but it looked impressive. So I thought I'd share it. Um, and, and UTIs, we've got some great talks about urine infection and indeed whether we should dip or not. And, um, you know, there are some organisations where they literally hold up the urine to the light to see if it looks pussy, which probably is more sensitive and more... Well, not more sensitive, but more specific for urinary tract infection than you know, a dipstick that shows one plus of leukocytes and then five days of trimethoprim that fo follows on autopilot, which we should never do, but, you know, unfortunately does beset us at the moment. And um, antibiotic resistance, huge problem. How hard is it in your healthcare setting to identify a resistant bug that has been grown previously on a patient, you know, within the past two or three years? It's, I find it really difficult sometimes when a patient comes in as an emergency and say they've we, we're one of three hospitals, so the results can go anywhere sometimes, and, and the patient isn't on the summary care record, so you're trying to track down, is this a resistant bug person, or is this someone I can get away with something slightly lower key? And it's all guesstimation at the moment because of our non-aligned IT systems and pathology systems. So we've got to think on about that as well in the context of what we're trying to do with infection and deterioration. Um, and so for certainly what I tell my juniors, I always get them to do a cat refill, um, mainly to feel the temperature of the skin, because you know, as one gets more shocked, it gets more clammy. Look for that mottling of skin, and then think about you know, function very, very early on, um, and not just your typical medical questions. Um, so this concept of not being able to walk, confusion, can't pee. Normality and baseline, particularly in those with chronic illness. Because a lot of COPD patients I see know their normal SATs. When, and the more we ask them, the more we, inf we reinforce that they should know, the more they will know, then the more they will volunteer. So my SATs are normally 90% doc, and, and you know they've come in with SATs of 85. I know that's significantly worse than normal. Or they're sitting at 90 still, probably going to be OK. It's so reassuring. It's so useful. And the more we can translate that with our patients. Our patients are carrier pigeons of information but we can also document it and transmit that electronically. Um, blood pressure normally, again, hypertensive patient on four different antihypertensives with a blood pressure of 160 normally, one assumes, because it's difficult to control doc. The GP was thinking of adding another anti, you know, antihypertensive in, so you know that's going to be hard to control blood pressure, and they tip up with a blood pressure of 110 systolic, you know there's an issue. Um, and then symptoms of those things, real symptoms that people actually complain of, you know, dizziness when they sit up or stand up. Um, and thinking about the younger patient, so who, who's going to hold their robs together until it's too late. You know, they'll fall off their perch, you know, and it might be the only thing they've got initially is a tachycardia. But, you know, your gut feel is telling you this is a sick patient who needs observation and they should be escalated and they should be observed and kept an eye on. Um, and the gold standard test as a result of all of this is clinical judgment and experience. You know, there isn't, there isn't a blood test that tells you at this point. Um, and you almost have to keep doing that review, the re-review, the re-review, you know, until you're happy there's been an improvement or that, you know, a diagnosis like sepsis has been excluded. Um, and I tell them all about the deflection across a range of observations because, you know, it's very rare you'll get someone signalling as you know, having an extreme observation when, the, you know, they're prelude to disaster. It's always a small deflection, a bit of tachycardia, a bit of a tachypnea, a bit of hypotension. Not massive, just a small deflection. And then, you know, thinking about the leadership of this condition. So sepsis delays really are rarely the, the cause of, are caused by individual error. You know, this is not individuals usually, certainly not in my medical career so far. It, it's been about the system um, time and time again, you know, poorly thought through systems, poorly aligned systems, maladjusted communication systems and assessment systems. And um, equally harmful, apart from that assumption of individualized error, is the, is the, is the role of, of, of trying to support not giving treatment sometimes when it's appropriate in our clinicians and training them not to give antibiotics and saying, look, 
I back you based on the evidence you've told me about. And encouraging the earlier senior review of patients who do fall off their perch and encouraging the systems within the organisations to enforce that. Um, you know, it's no junior person should be floundering in a, in a I don't know what to do situation when someone becomes really unwell and there is genuine concern and we've got to support our system, hospital, community, you name it, to allow that call for help. And that responsibility is the senior person's responsibility. It's not the most junior. So this concept of just leadership is really important as a result. Because when you look at the reasons for antibiotic failure or when there hasn't been an appropriate pickup of sepsis and administration, it, it does come down to systemic human factors nine times out of ten. It's very rarely someone's volitional desire to cause harm. And it's very rarely due to incompetence. Um, you know, you, people don't die because of a lack of knowledge in their healthcare provider. They die because usually a system problem is, is causing a, a latency and a, a reduction of the efficiency of the system as a whole. Um, and a lot of that's down to leadership. You know, leadership's role is to grease the wheels, make the optimization of pathways the right things to do, to make contingency when systems go down. Um, to try and remove the multitasking that happens every day, all the time, constant interruptions of people in critical roles, trying to remain focused on one patient at a time, but having 10 at the same time. And the skill mix is important as a result. And we can think about personnel, systems, usual human factors type things as we try and analyse our individual cases that we come across every day where antibiotics have missed the 60 minutes, for instance, on entry for a, an acute patient or a patient that's been left for hours. The measurement itself of this condition is really, really important. We've got processes, we've got balancing now with a combination of the sequin, antibiotic review, antimicrobial resistance, C. diff rates, um, and the sequin itself that's identifying screening treatment and then review of antibiotics. And a lot of trusts are now going down this line of producing that kind of map of cases that come in, um, the timeliness of antibiotics, the timeliness of prescription, and it's giving us a good systems engineering overview of the processes when patients come in sick. What we're not very good at are the outcomes. So we think about our main outcomes from sepsis, and this is, you know, I, I think about it in terms of death, I suppose costs, because, you know, we are here to save money as well, and then the future disability, which is not a small problem for survivors of sepsis. And you see, without that outcome measure, we're never going to get anywhere. And um, it really focused our minds on, on thinking about it. The more successful we were with measuring the process itself. So the sequin is, you know, for, for those that, that aren't involved in it, is a kind of method of remunerating trust based on their ability to do the right processes in screening and treating patients with sepsis. And then reviewing the antibiotic treatment 24, sorry, 72 hours post-admission. So it's great stuff that we've actually joined up, screening, treatment, and the review of those antibiotics all in the same heading. It's forcing people to talk who never used to talk. So microbiologists, antimicrobial pharmacists, and frontline clinicians. It's good at doing that. It's really important. Um, and then the CTGs remunerate based on how, how close you are to the mark. And if you look at the processes of, that lead to an emergency admission, usually the emergency department, because we're... I don't think we've had an a, a acute medicine bed for months in my place. Um, but yeah, they you know, usually end up in the emergency department and then are processed through a system of triage, testing, confirmation of sepsis, then treatment, which all is supposed to happen within the first hour. So a flurry of activity at the front line, entry point, and then the antibiotic review, and then discharge usually eight to 10 days later on average for a patient with infection. And the encouragement of this is a great lesson in carrot and stick. So we have articles in the press about you're terrible at sepsis and 55% of your patients coming in with sepsis die and some organisations have 15% or 10% so why aren't you as good and you know this is this is all about measuring sepsis with the right measurement if you measure sepsis with with the poor measurement that's what you get um, and then thinking of the carrot you know the letter from NHS England to those improver trust saying actually you're doing really well on this this is the way we need to be addressing things. If we really want improvement across the NHS, we've got to get rid of those paper articles and focus on the, what are you doing well? Let's encourage that, because that's the thing that's really going to deliver and change the, change the conversation completely. And it certainly has helped those organisations who have received that letter to, you know, to actually say to their departments, 
good God, look, you've done this. Well done, guys. You know, in a face, in face, in the face of corridor treatments of emergency patients and huge amounts of staffing gaps and resource deficits. This is the sort of message we need to be sending from the centre. So measurement of outcomes is really tricky, but actually, if you focus on patients that come into hospital with infection, you get a truer picture of a credible number that hasn't gone up and down like a balloon over the years. Because if you go after sepsis as a term, and because of the eight different definitions there are for sepsis at the moment in common use, and the six others that have been used historically over the past 10 years, the numbers of patients with sepsis have been really variable. And in that case, why are we measuring something that can't be measured and that is not credible? So it comes back to this concept of measuring infection that leads to an emergency admission, which is what we call suspicion of sepsis, SOS, for want of a better expression. Because if you actually measure sepsis numbers, and that's the graph on the right, you find that we were at 22,000 uh, five or six years ago, and now we're up to about 46,000, partly due to raised awareness, changing definitions, um, huge amounts of public-facing campaigns and, and professional awareness campaigns, with a halving of the mortality. Now, is that really genuine improvement, or is that just due to more awareness and more cases being called? So this is what sepsis numbers have done over the years. It's been like a yo-yo, based on the definition that's being used. Um, and if we get it down to something that's a bit more easy, certainly for me to understand, I, I think about infection that leads to hospital admission as being badness. Because if an equivalent wellness, I suppose, is you, you're well enough to be at home in the community, either treated with antibiotics or without antibiotics. The badness defines where you end up. So the badness might be in a hospital environment. You, if you're particularly bad, you're in intensive care, tubed. If you're moderately bad, you might get away with a few days in the hospital on intravenous antibiotics. Either way, you've crossed the threshold of badness by having to come into hospital as an emergency. We're really good at this country in only ensuring the right people come into hospital because we don't have the beds to be more, um, more free with them. And this is, this is what sets us apart from other countries where you've obviously remunerated for admitting patients like the US. We don't do that. We admit when we're desperate in the UK. We have no other choice. So if you look at the suspicion of sepsis box in more detail, you have those with suspected sepsis by our new criteria, so those who trigger the five, who, and then within that contingent, there will be a degree of sepsis, however we choose to define that. And um, it's these buckets that we can measure that become more reliable over time. And when you look at the numbers, it works out at about 20 million episodes of infection in the community that stay well enough to remain about 1.8 million episodes per year that come in as an emergency, so have suspicion of sepsis or SOS, and then 36,000, only 36,000 that are septic, that require intensive care admission. That's our real badness population, one could argue. Um, and they are defined by a worsening set of observations than any others. So th there's a paper that um, we wrote to try and define what that meant recently, um, and, and then the, the idea of that is, can we then use that to track our performance as an organization, as a region, as a country over time against infection, antimicrobial resistance, antimicrobial prescription, stewardship, um, ICU admissions, length of stay, future disability from infection, things like that. So, because it's the data we've really lacked over time and an ability to benchmark. And when you look at that coding set, you get to the, the summation that 75% of bed occupancy is, is due to an, SOS, essentially, and that um, nearly 42% of mortality is as well. So it, it's a big, big part of what we do. And when you track it over age groups, you find that the vast majority of people dying for it, and this is seven years' worth of data, so 500,000 odd deaths from SOS in England over seven years, you find that um, 350,000 of it was uh, above the age of 70. So the vast majority of those deaths are happening in patients who are 65, 70 plus. And that actually, you know, uh, pediatric death is horrible and you should never, and it should never be belittled, but actually with less than 500 deaths in children zero to four who are coming into hospital with an infection, it means, you know, it puts in perspective where the people that are really dying of infection with badness really sit. When you look at the mortality, what you find is that actually 99.94% of patients at the age of so pediatric cases between the age of zero to four admitted with an emergency with infection in England survive. 
but actually your mortality, as soon as one gets to the extreme of age, is nearly 10, 13, 15, 21%. So again, this is about a slight reality check on the fact that paediatric death is horrible, but actually most of the time we get it right. That's not saying we, it's an untouched area that shouldn't be addressed properly, but actually the people that are dying are older people. And this is our area and our low-hanging fruit potentially to how we can improve infection in this country. And, and over time, and it's been really good to see this, and I know that there was mention earlier this morning about 1,600 lives saved, which is all terrific with the sequin. And I, I don't know how they arrived at that percentage, but I suspect, or numbers, but I suspect it was due to delta deflection. So the, the fact that we were getting better as a country anyway before the sequin, and then the, def, the improvement past that. But, but actually, when you look at the numbers of SOS deaths over um, the past seven years, the number of cases which are growing, um, and then the mortality within, we can actually start to see that we're probably saving a significant number of lives, probably more than the 1,600. Um, and, and, you know, this is stuff we need to be, again, sharing and spreading. And, and this is what our acute organisations and our community organisations all around the country need to be telling everyone that work within, because actually England is getting a hell of a lot better at dealing with infection um, and SOS and sepsis or whatever we want to call it. Um, and we probably just need to be better at sharing it. Cause, because it's that, that's the positive messaging that's going to get people on side and, and to continue delivering the improvements that we need as an NHS. In terms of how that is forming, so we, we produced an SOS dashboard that's going to be held by the PSMU, um, so the Patient Safety Measurement Unit, um, and what it's going to allow is you to interrogate your organisation's performance against SOS um, over the past three or four years, I believe, and then you can produce your own run chart. So if you're into quality improvement, you can see what intervention I've made at this point to lead to this improvement. Eventually, we're going to produce a SOS SHMI, so a kind of hospital standardized mortality ratio against these codes to actually see how we're doing. And um, we've got it down to postcodes in some areas, so we can actually assess GP practices and you know really quite detailed stuff. Um, when you apply SOS to news, um, what, we've, what we know is that the higher your news, the greater the chance of having an infection. Um, and that having an SOS code gives you about 4.5 times the mortality of all your other codes. Um, in terms of ORC, it's really high in SOS and news. Um, and it, it should and probably will be the defined early warning score of choice for the, certainly us in the NHS. I think we've got about three minutes, haven't we? I haven't really got solutions, so I kind of put that up in hopeful expectation. So I, I think it might be, would it be good to take some questions maybe in discussions and comments? Oh, can I just show you this? This comes from South Tees, and it's one of the most impressive slides I've ever seen in my life. So this is their sepsis champions from their wards. Isn't that amazing? So every single one of these wards has got a sepsis champion, and I, I just love that. I love the fact that they've got that engagement, and I, I'm very jealous <laughs> working where I work to see something like that. And their advertisements are tr truly tremendous. Liverpool are doing this. Um, and, you know, various... This is quite a good one, because visibility is really important for trust boards. You know, how do we make sure they're on side with thinking about sepsis? It's trying to produce something that they're actually going to be able to relate to and, and fully understand. There are four sets of, recent, of current resources that might be of use. We've got a kind of pragmatic guide to leadership in sepsis and AMR coming out from Health Education England. Should be ready by Easter. Um, that will be for each executive board in every single organisation. So the idea is they train themselves about sepsis AMR and then enforce it, we hope. There is a right care scenario that's coming out in March um, as, as authored by, um, sorry, as led by Sir Bruce Keogh, um, looking at an optimal and a suboptimal case of sepsis the implementation guidance, this great article from Mervyn Singer that came out in the acute um, medicine section of the Clinical Medicine Journal, um, and again, very pragmatic. Um, Anthony Lawton and the NHS Right Care team have really produced this, this, this really good resource, and I promised to show a video, if I've got time. This is some work. Is it working?
across England. And this call to action on sepsis is a vital part of that work. Sepsis, one of Britain's biggest killers. Sepsis affects a quarter of a million people across the United Kingdom every year, and it causes more deaths than breast cancer, bowel cancer and prostate cancer put together. Poor treatment is causing thousands of preventable deaths. Was my mother one of them? She went in there not very ill, and inside 48 hours she was dead. Sepsis is the body's response to overwhelming infection. Often that starts as relatively trivial infection, but then progresses to something really quite serious. Although most people receive uh, prompt and effective treatment to make a good recovery, there are a large number of people who go on to suffer devastating consequences of sepsis, ranging from death through to limb loss, organ failure, or loss of fingers and toes. And this can have a, a horrible and long-lasting effect on individuals and their families. The difficult thing about sepsis is that it can be quite difficult to diagnose because it masquerades as so many things in so many different individuals. But the, the first thing to do in any diagnostic process is to think of the diagnosis. And the more people who potentially think of diagnosis, the better. And that's why the right care approach to sepsis is so important. One of the reasons why I, as national medical director, and so many other clinicians are keen to tackle the problem of sepsis in our society and our health service is that we've all seen the consequences of sepsis and we've all felt that feeling of utter helplessness as we've seen patients deteriorate in front of our eyes from sepsis that is out of control and in many cases that is quite simply avoidable for everybody by making an early diagnosis and instituting early treatment. This is not any one person's business. Everybody has to think sepsis, ranging from patients and their families through to nurses and doctors in the healthcare system. And we need to make it easy for the diagnosis to be confirmed and for treatment to be instituted quickly. And that is the essence of the programmatic approach that right care brings to the tackling of this absolutely horrible problem which affects our service day in and day out. You know, getting this right is a, just a big win for everybody. Not only will we save lives and untold suffering, but we will also save money for the health service and society. It's estimated that hospitals spend about a billion pounds a year on treating sepsis. And when you take the longer term consequences of sepsis into account, it's estimated that there's a financial burden of about eight billion pounds a year on healthcare and social care services. All of that could be better invested elsewhere. Because sepsis affects so many people in this country, and because it has such potentially devastating effects, and because if we diagnose and treat it early, we can make such a big impact, it is clear to me that sepsis and tackling sepsis is everybody's business. And the people who are absolutely key in marshalling the war against sepsis and focusing on this endeavour are commissioners who have oversight of the whole of our health and social care landscape. And so my plea today is to ask commissioners to take this very seriously and to work closely with right care to bring a programmatic approach to tackling sepsis across our society.